This is Cynocephali, near the modern town of Larissa in central Greece. I'm Matthew Settle. In 197 BC, Philip V of Macedon fought a fierce battle here against a Roman army that was determined to destroy him. The stakes were high. Both Rome and Macedon were fighting for control of Greece. If Rome won, she would rule the entire Mediterranean world. But Sinocephali was not just a battle between two military powers. It was a battle between two ways of fighting, between the old way of the Greeks and the new way of Rome. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they had. Now, on Decisive Battles. Macedon in northern Greece was the homeland of Alexander the Great. Philip V wanted to follow in the footsteps of his famous ancestor and make Macedon a great power once again. He became king in 221 BC at the age of 17, and for the next 40 years he set about expanding his kingdom. But he was worried by the rising power of Rome. The Macedonians were the heirs of Alexander. Rome, on the other hand, is an up-and-coming power, and the Romans had two things which the Macedonians at this period didn't. They had huge reserves of manpower, and they had great determination. They wouldn't give in. In 216 BC, the Romans were defeated by the Carthaginian general, Hannibal, at Cannae. Philip immediately forged an alliance with Hannibal. For the next 20 years, he attacked the states in the eastern Mediterranean that were loyal to Rome, the so-called client states. Like the Russians and their um, buffer states in the Cold War, Rome had buffer states on the edges of its empire. Wherever they go, the next state is always got to be a buffer state. And the person who rules that state can only rule it as long as the Romans agree with me. In 202 BC, Hannibal was finally defeated at Zama in northern Africa. But this did not stop Philip's drive to control all of Greece. The Greek city-states, led by Athens, appealed to Rome for help. For them, even rule from Rome was preferable to Philip's brutal regime. The Romans were keen to help. They had an iron grip on most of the Mediterranean. Greece was the last piece in the jigsaw. But the war against Hannibal had exhausted Rome. Although she sent an army against Philip in 200 BC, she didn't have the stomach to fight. It was not until three years later, in 197 BC, that a campaign was organized in earnest. The job fell to Titus Flaminius, a consul, one of two men elected each year to govern Rome. In time of war, consuls also served as supreme military commanders. He was only 30, which is young for a consul, but he had served with distinction in the war against Hannibal. He and his armies left for Greece. Philip and Flaminius were pretty evenly matched. Each commanded armies of roughly 25,000 men. The Roman commander, Flaminius, he was a politician, but the army he was using was a veteran of the war against Hannibal. The whole of this army was formed up from people who had spent their whole life in arms. Flaminius had around 20,000 infantry organized as legions, 2,000 slingers, 2,500 cavalry, and 20 elephants. The Romans were much more used to fighting enemy elephants than they were to using them themselves. Elephants are normally only used against cavalry because horses don't like the smell of elephants. Philip had 16,000 infantry, 4,000 slingers, 
around 5,000 mercenaries and allies, and about 2,000 cavalry. He fought like the Greeks had done for hundreds of years, and like his ancestor, Alexander the Great, in phalanx formation. His men grouped tightly together in a mass of pointed spears. Macedonian phalanx was becoming increasingly heavy, so it gave a much greater offensive power than the classical phalanx. For each Roman soldier, there would be almost 10 pikes in his face. Both armies shadowed each other, searching for a suitable battlefield, waiting for the right moment to attack. By June 197 BC, they were here, camped on opposite sides of a series of ridges with hillocks called cynocephali. Sinocephali was not intended as a battlefield. It was a range of hills, uh, the, the name means dogs' heads, uh, hills, uh, which were in between the marching Roman and Macedonian armies. Philip placed light troops on the top of the ridge, but he had no idea where the Roman troops were deployed. A dense morning mist had settled between the ridges and was taking time to disperse. Visibility was poor. The Macedonians really didn't know the Romans were coming up the hill because of the early morning fog. The Romans really didn't know whether they would find any Macedonians, or if they did find some, whether they would be assembled in full battle arrays. Flaminius sent out a small force of scouts and cavalry to explore the higher ground. Suddenly, they peered through the mist and found themselves looking straight at scouts from the Macedonian army. fight began for the high ground. The commanders on both sides called for reinforcements. The men who've contacted the enemy at the front are saying, please come and send us support. Uh, we can win here. This was a real king of the hill fight. The Romans pushed the Macedonians up on the slope of the hill. The Macedonians regrouped and pushed the Romans right back down the hill. Skirmishes from both sides met and fought fiercely. There was a lot at stake. Philip was fighting for survival, the Romans for total supremacy. One ninety seven BC. Rome is battling to stop Philip of Macedon from seizing control of Greece. As the mist cleared, both Flaminius and Philip were nervous about sending reinforcements. No commander likes to be brushed into a battle against uh, his or her better judgment. Also, they don't want to be caught out and miss an opportunity. The terrain didn't suit either army. It wasn't flat enough to line up the Roman legions or the Macedonian phalanx in battle formation. Where a phalanx does not want to fight is in hills and in conditions in which there's not good atmospheric conditions. In other words, they need visibility, they need a flat space so that these spears can be unleashed. It was very difficult to form a phalanx quickly. The phalanx usually consisted of 16 ranks of spearmen called phalangites. Each carried a 20-foot spear. The first five ranks held their spears level. The remaining 10 ranks held their spears at a slope to deflect arrows and sling stones. The phalanx has been called essentially a gigantic pin cushion. They would hold this hedge of pikes out in front of them. This gave them a great advantage over troops normally equipped who couldn't reach the phalangites with their uh, shorter spears, whereas the phalanx could quite literally steamroller them uh, into defeat. It normally took hours to get an army into phalanx formation and Philip had 16,000 infantry to organize. Flaminius had an easier task. The Roman army fought in three lines, each of which were divided into squares called maniples. This was a loose and flexible formation and gave the Romans the edge. The legion might have 30 maniples, and the idea was that they could be either flexible sort of a checkerboard formation if they 
were up against lighter armed troops, but if they met a phalanx such as Phillips, then they could coalesce and uh, have a solid front. If the phalanx can be characterized as a pin cushion, the Roman legion, by contrast, was like a buzzsaw. The legionaries emphasized the use of the sword, and they would carve their way quite literally and ruthlessly and bloodily through opponents. The Roman and Macedonian cavalry battled as both commanders hurried to assemble their armies. Philip was encouraged by reports that Roman skirmishers had been driven back. But if he exploited this advantage, he would have to attack with his phalanxes only half formed up. He ordered half his phalanxes, about 8,000 men, to assemble at the top of the slope. Philip may have held the high ground, but by this time, Flaminius had managed to line up all his legions at the bottom of the slope, on the plain in front of the Macedonians. Philip now had to make a crucial decision. His phalanx had overwhelming force, but the Romans were more flexible. Should he go for a knockout blow before the Romans could move around either side and encircle him? He knows that his Macedonian forces, by their weight, by their momentum, the depth of their formation, the pikes and so on, will be able to prevail. He can't afford to wait and leave the initiative to the Romans because that will enable the Romans to outflank him. But the other half of the Macedonian army, the left wing under its commander Nicanor, was still forming up and was not ready for action. Philip weighed the risks. He ordered the attack. As the phalanx rolled forward, every Roman threw his spear, the pilum, into the closely packed troops. The Macedonians crashed into the Roman left wing and drove them down the slope. The poor Romans on the left wing had to confront these pikes that uh, were heading down at a great speed toward them. So anybody who was in that particular path of that onrushing uh, sea of spears would be annihilated. But instead of going to the aid of the legionary, Flaminius decided to hit the enemy where it would hurt most. Flaminius is relying on the endurance of the Roman legions. So even though they're being pushed back, they are not breaking. Flaminius has the time to do something else, and he does that with his right wing. Flaminius sent his own right wing against Nicanor and the Macedonian left, who had just struggled to summit the hill. The legion and the phalanx were locked in combat. The legionaries with sword and shield against the wall of razor-sharp spears. Flaminius had taken a huge gamble. Phalanx had never been defeated in battle. The Romans would have to do what no other army had ever done, fight their way through a forest of spears. 197 BC. Rome is battling to stop Philip of Macedon from seizing control of Greece. The Roman commander Flaminius has thrown his legions against the phalanx. The front ranks are trying to cut a path through the spears. The method you have to deal with is get inside the spears. Once you pass the front spear, he can't touch you. He's, he's dead meat. And once you pass the second spear, he's out of the battle. And if you can get past the fifth spear, the battle is over, because there is nothing they can do. The men in the phalanx fought in tight formation, no more than three feet apart. The Romans fought five feet apart. Unlike the soldiers in the phalanx, they could move around to cover gaps in formation. The Romans were fairly short people. The sword they adopted was a sword which entirely suited the style of fighting of a smaller man against the bigger man. A gladius hispaniensis, Spanish sword, primarily used for thrusting into the opponent's torso. 
or because of its double-edged and weight, hacking. The Greek historian Polybius tells how Philip tried to bring his badly wounded comrades back to his camp. And he looks at them and he won't do it because he's, he says, there are arms severed at the shoulders, heads nearly cut off, ghastly wounds in the stomach, and he can't bring them back into camp. And that is the effect that the Roman Gladius Hispaniensis had. Flaminius concentrated his attack on the Macedonian left wing, which had never managed to form up properly. But the battle was finally balanced. In a last ditch attempt to break the deadlock, he ordered his 20 elephants to attack. Elephants, they have a bad rap in antiquity as sort of unpredictable assets that can turn on your own men. But they serve the Romans very well in frightening and breaking up Macedonian phalangites. The Macedonian left was forced back, but over on the right wing, they continued to dominate the Romans. The victorious Macedonians on their right push forward, the defeated Macedonians on their left are pushed back. A gap opens. It's then up to the Romans to see whether they can exploit that. But the crucial difference between the legion and the phalanx can be summed up in one word, initiative. Once the phalanx was sent into action, it was impossible to change the battle plan. But the Roman unit commanders were allowed to change tactics on the spot. One of these, we don't even know his name, spotted the chance to outflank the Macedonian phalanx and attack it from the rear. He took 20 maniples, about 2,000 men, and led them round behind Philip's line. The Romans are able to do so, not because their general is at the key point, but because of the initiative that they have within their system of command. This phalanx, with its five ranks of leveled spears, was designed for frontal assault. It was an all-or-nothing tactic. Either it steamrolled the enemy and drove it from the field, or it could be outflanked. That is the great problem of phalanx warfare. You commit the phalanx, and you can't then do anything about it if something goes wrong. Another problem was that the phalanx absorbed all available manpower, while the Romans had men in reserve. The commanders of these reserve troops were free to make tactical decisions, which could change the course of the battle. Battles are often decided by small numbers of troops who are able to take the initiative and attack the enemy from an unexpected direction where the, the men there are not prepared to resist. This was exactly what 2,000 Roman legionaries now did as they attacked the Macedonian phalanx from the rear. The phalanx was so vulnerable to attack from the back because they were armed with 20-foot spears which were held at waist level and you simply cannot turn. It is impossible. You have to lift your pike upright, turn, and lower it again. And that's not possible. In the rear, the phalanx was almost like an inside of an eggshell. It was absolutely fluid, vulnerable, and was, could be cut to pieces very quickly. Every member of the phalanx was focused on pushing forward. The men in the rear ranks were taken by total surprise. They were so fixated on the forward push, which was the phalanx's speciality. So it really is a classic illustration of the inflexibility of the phalanx compared to the flexibility of the Roman legion. There was complete panic in the Macedonian ranks. They began to retreat in their thousands, raising their spikes as a symbol of surrender. Either the Romans didn't understand the signal, or they just ignored it. They slaughtered thousands of the retreating army. The Macedonians, of course, in utter shock at this betrayal of the rules of war, uh, are dumbstruck and many of them are cut down, and then, of course, they flee in panic. 8,000 Macedonian troops were killed, 5,000 taken prisoner. Flaminius lost only 700 men. And so Philip's power in Greece was broken. Rome's peace terms were harsh. He paid a ransom of 10,000 talents, the equivalent of $200 million today. 5,000 was paid up front, and he had 10 years to pay the balance. 
He was forced to surrender his fleet and hand over hostages, including his youngest son, Demetrius, who was held in Rome. One factor in the Roman success is that the Romans were playing for higher stakes. The Greek kingdoms, Greek armies, when they lost, they were used to the rules of war, that they would surrender, they would be treated well. For the Romans, it's all or nothing. The Romans hailed Flaminius as the liberator of Greece, but the Greeks had merely exchanged one conqueror for another. What was important about this was not just that Rome won, but it was able to establish a permanent presence in Greece. Sinocephaly 197 BC is a key date because it's the date that Rome becomes number one. In just 20 years, Rome's armies had gone from total defeat at the hands of Hannibal to total domination. For centuries, Greece had been at the center of Western civilization. After Sinocephali, the torch was passed across the sea to Italy. Now Rome and its legions had a stranglehold on the entire Mediterranean world.